Amen. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. And I'd ask if you'd stand with me this morning as we read the Word of God and go before God in prayer. Exodus chapter 16. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 11. I'm going to read a good number of verses here. Read down to verse 24. If you'd bear with me, I, there's a reason why I'd like to get all that reading in this morning. Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at evening the quails came up, and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of per your persons. Take ye every man for, uh, uh, for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing left over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. But some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man, according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for every man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye shall bake today, and see that ye will see. And that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning. Moses bade, and it did not stink. Neither was there any worm therein. This morning, the title of my message is, What is that smell? What is that smell? Let's go before the Lord today. God, we just thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you today. And Lord, I thank you for your word that you have given unto us. And as we read these things and we examine these things, help us to understand the illustration and the teaching that you may have, the truth that we can find about your character and about our need, God, and also about how you direct us and give us your commandments. God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to focus our attention on your word this morning. I pray, God, that you would use me as your servant here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when I'm looking at the word of God, when I'm looking at the Bible, and especially looking at the Old Testament, a lot of times we're looking at things and we're saying to ourselves, what does this mean and what is the purpose of this? And perhaps sometimes we just find the Old Testament to be interesting stories, or we find it to be something that is uh, uh, maybe even a little bit entertaining in a way when we learn different things. But here's what the Bible says about the, about the Scriptures. And when we look at these Old, Old Testament types, 
I want you to understand something. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It gives us hope when we see how, you know what, what's interesting to me? If you look at the children of Israel, now the children of Israel, I would never say that it's a picture of the church, but I would say it's a picture of the individual. And when you look at the children of Israel and their relationship with God, one thing that is always amazing to me is the long-suffering attitude that God had. The way that he bore them up even when they were disobedient and really went as far as he could go. I mean, if you look at even when Israel was captured by the Babylonians and brought away in captivity, starting in the book of Isaiah and seeing Almost a hundred years later, in the book of Jeremiah, when that prophecy comes to fruition, and we see that they're carried away, God was long-suffering during all this time in teaching them and, and telling them and, and trying to convince them and trying to persuade them. And that's a long period of time. That was lifetimes for some of the people during that time period where God was dealing with them. But God was long-suffering, and God cared about them, and God provided for them, and God wanted them to do right. And he wanted them to do right for their own good. And I think that's an important thing for us to understand. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them uh, which walk so uh, for us as having an ensample. We have examples. I actually wanted to put another scripture in there, and I copied the wrong one in there. But the Bible also tells us that we have it as an ensample, and that ensample means that it's like a stamp. Like something that we can look at and say, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be done. So we see two ways that God uses the scriptures. One way is as an example. As an example for us. Now, you know, we were talking the, uh, during our meeting with Dr. Carter, and he, he was talking about how some people say, well, that's an Old Testament thing, or we don't use to, need to use the Old Testament. Well, there's a lot of things the Old Testament teaches us that the New Testament does not mention because it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, it's not like God said, just throw the Old Testament out now because we're only dealing with the New Testament. It's still things that God wants us to learn. In fact, there are many sins. This incest is not mentioned in the New Testament. Boy, it is abhorred in the Old Testament, and rightly so. And there are many things that are taught in the Old Testament that are very true for us. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and, and he shall direct thy path. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. There are many good scriptures. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, thy strength and thy redeemer. The Bible tells us, run to us, a child is born unto us, a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Isaiah 9, 6. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, there are many scriptures that we preach today, and we use today, and they teach us but also even the illustrations themselves teach us things about the character of God, about the long-suffering of God, about the desire that God has for us to follow his commandments. Sometimes you look at things, and, and you look at things in the Old Testament, and you see numbering of the tribes and numbering of the people, and you say, what is that going to teach us? God knew every single person. Every single person was important. Every single person had a purpose. Every single person affected the outcome of the nation and of the tribe and of their relationship with God. God wanted you to know he was numbering every single one. The Bible tells us that God has numbered even the number of hairs on our head. He knows everything. In other words, and when it says that, it's not that God's like a hair counter. How many hairs you got there? <laughs> You know, i got a lot of hair in my head that you can't see. But you know, I can feel it. I can feel it. And when I do this, it feels like it's combing over. Does it look okay? <laughs> I mean, I know that nobody else can see it, but I feel it. And I feel like I'll go like this sometimes. 
you know, when no one's around, it's like, you know. <laughs> I mean, nobody can say, but God has numbered. Now, why does God say that? This, you know, understand why God said he numbered the hairs of our head. He numbered the hairs of a head because you know what happens when you're sick? You lose your hair. When you haven't sustained your body enough, obviously, <laughs> I've been doing some sustaining. Uh, <laughs> but when you're starving, when you're not getting the proper nutrition, when things aren't going, you know, you're going to lose hair. And so God says, I know. I know when you're losing hair. I know when things are getting thin. I know when you're having a tough time. You know, our church has times when we are flourishing and times when we are struggling. Right now, we're going through a little bit of a tighten the belt syndrome around here. And I'm trying to do everything I can to cut back. And, it, and it's not that, it's just that the way things have worked out. We had a few expenses and some things came up. But God knows. I can rest, I can tell you, and I can, I can complain, and I can call other preachers and say, you know what I'm going through? I can do those things, but, but honestly, God knows. And when we lose the, when anything happens in our life, God knows. And we see these illustrations in the Old Testament. When I look at the tabernacle, and I see how precise God was with every single part of building the tabernacle, that tells me how precise God's command is from his word. That every single part is important. I tell people all the time, you know, you cannot follow your emotions, your intellect, but you can follow the Word of God. The heart is deceitful above all things the Bible teaches us. Sometimes I find that there are people that I love very much and I think the world of, and then they fall into sin or it turns out they did some criminal dastardly thing and we're all shocked. We see people in the news and whatever and people that we respect and people we see things have done things in history. The heart is deceitful. Amen. We can't see their heart. They can't see our heart. We have desires. We look at things emotionally. We're emotional, we're emotional beings. But the word of God is not. Thy word is truth. The Bible says, this is where we know what is right and what is wrong is from the Word of God. So I take these things very importantly as I look at it. And let me go down to this book of Exodus just for a minute here in, in, in chapter number 16. Let me go back to the passage of Scripture I began with. Uh, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. You know, the first thing I think of, God don't like murmurings. If you study the Old Testament, and even it's mentioned in the New Testament too, don't murmur. Do you know what murmur is? That's murmur. You know what? I don't let my kids murmur. You know what I do? I tell them, don't murmur. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> See, he's, he's murmuring. He knows. He, let me tell you something. I don't like the kids complaining and whining and and, and, and doing things like, you know, complaining about things that they can't change and they can't do and they don't like this and not appreciating and respecting others that have done things for them. You know, I don't like them if I've gone to a house where there's been once or twice when they've got a good reaming out because we went somewhere and, and uh, you know, they bring out baked chicken and the kids look at them and go, you don't have anything that's fried? You know, they do like that and you feel like, you know, wringing their necks, but <laughs> son... <laughs> You know, <laughs> you give them that look. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you later about that. But, you know, don't murmur. God don't like murmur. What does God want us to do? He wants us to accept our lot. He wants us to know the safety is of the Lord. He wants us to know that God knows the numbers ahead. He wants us to know that he has provided for us. He wants us to know. He wants us. Do you know what? Here's an amazing thing. You say, but preacher, you don't understand the trials I'm going through. You know what? I do understand the trials you're going through. we got some folks in our church over the last several months that have really been hit spiritually. I've talked to some folks here. Some have really gone through some real spiritual battles because of health. Some have gone through because of other emotional issues and, and relationships and all kinds of things. And we've had some folks that have really been hit hard. I do understand that. And I've had some of those things in my life too. But I'm also going to tell you, it's nice if we could sit up and say everything will just be sweet, smelling roses. But you know what? God also said, endure hardness like a good soldier. 
like a good soldier. You know, the old-time preachers, when you talk about the church, the church here in earth, this church here, they called it the militant church. Now, the reason why they called it the militant church is not because they wanted it to be like uh, looked at as an angry, or, or, but because we're in a battle here. And, the, and when we get to heaven, they call that church the triumphant church. That's when we have the victory. And so when we're down here, we have a battle, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of wickedness in high places. Our battle is a spiritual battle, but we are in a battle. The devil is seeking whom he may devour. And we're going to have problems. If you don't understand, why am I having these problems? And I say this all the time, because you cannot have a victory without a battle. You cannot have faith without a trial. Can you, what kind of prayer life would we really have if just everything we asked for just came right away or we just had never had a need? Never had a need. And when, you know, the preacher came in and said, uh, who's got a prayer request today? And we're like, nobody. Ah, great. Another week. And you turn on the news and it's like, sorry, folks, no bad news today, only good news. You know, that just isn't going to happen. We're going to have tough times in this world. Listen, I'm listening to the news this morning, and they're talking about all the violence and all the crime and, and the things going on. And, and they're like, what's the matter? And they got these people that are psychologists and analysts and po politicians, and everybody's got an answer. I'm going to tell you something. Here's the answer. Here it is right here. It's called the Word of God. It's called the truth. It's called the light. It's called the mirror. It's called the fire. It's the thing from which we, it's called the bread of life. It's called our sustenance. And I'm going to tell you right now, they kicked it out of the schools in America. They made it seem like a crime to walk around and use it and believe it. But if we want to straighten out people and we want to help people, this is what we need. Amen. The Word of God. That's where the answer is. And let me tell you, as Christians, we ought to be careful. Don't lose faith in God because the world's going astray. God told us it would. My hope is not in this world. My hope is in Christ. I pity those people that have a hope in this world, that the only pleasure they have is in this world, that the only thing that they think that they can affect are the things in this world, that the only power that they think they have is the power of their fists or the power of their gun or the power of their might. The power that we have is the power in Christ, and he has given us a job, and he told us all power is given unto me in heaven and earth and he said go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them teaching them to observe this is the power God has given us Amen. oh man this is what we need Amen. this is what will supply our soul you know here let me let me continue here you know as I'm looking at this look at verse number 15 he says and when the children of Israel saw it they said one to another it is manna. You know, the word that that's taken from gives the idea of what? 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 You know, it's like people, there's a commercial right now, and it says, what is that? And they go on and on, and then finally there's a cop in the car, and he goes, what is that car? You know, but it was like they didn't know what it was. What? What? And literally, I was reading a couple commentaries of this. They said that this word... The, the way they translated it, manna, it, to, what it really literally means is whatness. You know, whatness. They didn't know what it was. You know, here's the thing I realized. Manna was unlike anything else. <laughs> Do you know we don't have manna today? Uh, some of you look stunned. <laughs> look at what manna is. I mean, we have it as an illustration. We have the story of the manna, but you can't pick up anything and say, this is just like manna. I remember Jack Fijo, Barbara will remember years ago, he used to eat pizza and Mountain Dew and say, manna and dew. He used to say it all the time. And as sweet as pizza, pizza can be, I can tell you right now, it's not manna. Manna is unlike anything else. You know, this is one of the greatest miracles that took place in the Bible. 
It almost just gets stepped over. Yeah, they had bread. They ate it. Look at verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years. 40 years. For 40 years, let me tell you something. I would welcome God to supply bread for this boy right here for 40 days. <laughs> my, my, my boys, you know, they're, they're like, Sean, he's a quiet kid, he's a good kid, but boy, this kid can eat a couple of plates of food. I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> and I love them. And I see how my kids eat. I can't imagine the nation of Israel, all the children of Israel, for 40 years, 40 years, every single day, every day, more than, what would that be, more than 12,000 days, God every day rained down bread and fed them. What can God do for you? You know, I heard about a church. Sometimes I'll hear somebody say, oh, yeah, that guy's got a great ministry, but you see the debt they have? They have. What is debt to God? He provided a nation bread for 40 years. What is our financial needs? What is our, our, our $9,000 for, for chairs compared to 40 years of manna? You know what we really need to do is believe in the power of God. God wants, us, God wants us to look at these things and say, oh, yeah, God can do it. If we had a banner, we ought to just put up a banner that says, God can do it. Because we need to be reminded of that all the time. It's not us that we're depending upon, it's God. We trusted God for our salvation. We're not saved by what we can do. If we think we're saved by what we can do, we're going to be sadly disappointed. Because you know what we're going to find out? We can't do it. We can't live righteously. We can't be perfect. We get up. One day we feel great. Another day we feel really bad. I did something really stupid this last week. I know, shock. But again, the stunned faces. Someone had turned me on to this gluten cutter thing where you could, you could eat some gluten and it had like a pill. You took these pills and it was supposed to just pass right through your system and not cause any problems. Missed it. <laughs> it caused problems. <laughs> I tried it. I said, I got to try this. I thought about it. My wife bought it. It sat there for more than two months. And I thought, and it was good until 2016, so it wasn't like it was expired or anything. But I sat there looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. And you know how much I would love to dive into some gluten. So I, I didn't get like a major gluten meal, but I had a meal that had some gluten in it. And whoa, was I sick. I was sick, 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 sick. And I felt so rotten, and I felt so bad. And when I first got sick, I said, I'm going to endure it like a soldier. But by the end of the day, I was in the infirmary, and I didn't care about the war. <laughs> you know, we have those moments. But when we have those moments, we stop and we think to ourselves, praise the Lord, it's not on my shoulders. And I have the needs of my family, and I have the needs of my church, and I have the ne and, and I don't have to, you know, I have my eternal soul, and I have all these things that I'd like to see good for. I don't have to worry about these things. I can pray to God. I can ask God to save me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and I can be eternally saved because I put my faith in what Christ did. And I can understand, as we're talking about, in fact, we're going to be talking again Tonight, I hope you can come tonight. I'm talking out of Acts chapter 20. And the Bible tells us there that Jesus Christ, that God shed his blood for the church. Not a universal invisible body church. The local church, he says, he, that, that he told them to feed the church of God, uh, the flock of God over which God hath made you overseers. Talking to the pastors. He was talking about the church at Ephesus to those Ephesians, but even to us, Lighthouse Baptist Church, Jesus Christ shed his blood for this church. How much he loved it. 
That's how much he loves us. I don't have to worry. What do I have to do? I have to obey. You know, there are some things we don't understand. I don't understand these things exactly here. We can imagine what manna was like. I don't know that we could actually do it real justice. Verse 31 says, And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like the wafers made with honey. So looking at the other one, talked about it being like a little hoarfrost, and now this one tells you it's like a coriander seed. Now you're all confused, aren't you? You're thinking to yourself, what exactly did it look like? What was it? Here's the thing. We don't have anything like it today. You know what happened when the sun came up? It melted. It melted. You know what happened when they kept it when they weren't supposed to? It bred worms. You know what happened when they kept it during the Sabbath? It stayed. We don't have anything like it today. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms, and it rained down manna upon them to eat and, get, and given them of corn of, of heaven. Of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Now, I don't think angels have to eat. I would be surprised if they had to eat. I don't know if that means that this is the angels' food, that they ate it, or food prepared by angels. I don't know. But for 40 years, it rained down. And they didn't know what it was. And they didn't sit there and say, you know, I don't know about this. Little white seeds, looks like frost, tastes like honey. I don't know about that. Can't be good for you. <laughs> it was a miracle of God. It had to be good. But see, what I learn about this is even the miracles of God come with a purpose and come with a restriction and a commandment of God that God wants us to do. Look what he says here. Notwithstanding, in verse number 20, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was wroth with them. So here, here, here it was, rotting. Now, it's interesting because this manna can be used as an illustration. And I find two illustrations that I can find that are completely in opposition to each other, but they're real illustrations. One of them, of course, it's an illustration of Christ. And I'll show you, I'll show you in John chapter 6. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue in Exodus, but I'm going to turn in John chapter 6 if you want to, or I'll just read it and you can listen. John chapter 6. And verse number 48. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking here, in fact, I'll go back to verse 47. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Most important thing. Not what you do. Not where you're from. Not what you haven't done. If you put your faith in Christ, you have everlasting life. Okay? I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ died for every single person. Every person. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that hath eaten me hath he that shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. What's he talking about? Faith. Faith. 
in Christ. He's not talking about literally eating him. He didn't want them to come up and start gnawing on him. He didn't want them to come up and say, and he wasn't, and no one was doing this. And it does, when we take the Lord's Supper, God explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that it is a symbol, it is a picture, it is done in the memory, but it does not become literal flesh, little blood. What is it that saves us? Our faith in what he did. Our faith, it is our consumption spiritually to put all of our faith in him. You know, when you eat something, you have completely put it in you. You have completely given yourself to it. Have you ever eaten something or drink? There's times I go in here and I have a cup of water under here. And one time I, 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 I took that water and I started drinking. I said, something don't taste right. And I look at it, it was kind of icky looking. And I realized I had left my water on the table over there. And this was like from last week. But guess what? I couldn't go like this. <laughs> the damage was done. <laughs> I took it in me. When you eat it, it's gone, man. It's going to go in there, and it's coming out one way or the other, but you have committed yourself to the consumption of that and whatever it's going to do to you. And what Christ is using is this illustration. He says, I don't want you to just take a taste. I don't want you to say, yeah, I think that good. I don't want you to say, oh, that smells good. I want you to understand that you have to consume it, that you have to commit yourself to it, that you have to say, I'm not just trusting in Christ in the things that I do. I'm not just trusting in Christ and the works that I have, I am completely trusting in the blood of Christ that was shed for me at Calvary that I might be saved. Amen. Consumption. So manna is a picture of that. Manna obviously is a picture of sin too. Because it rot. It rotted. Do you know sin rots? The Bible tells us in James chapter 1, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Sin is destructive. I preach and teach against sin. Sometimes I call sin by name, and I meet her out what the Bible says about sin. And sometimes people look at me and say, oh, you're so harsh. You know why? It's destructive. It will hurt you. It will rot your life out. Amen. What is it that caused the problem here? I call this the stinking miracle. Because at this point, it begins to stink. Again, verse number 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Here comes the title of my message. What is that smell? Because can you imagine? Honey, Moses said, don't leave it until morning. Oh, come on. It's a miracle. It came from God. How can it go bad? It's got to be good. In the morning, they wake up, and they're like, what is that smell? Have you ever done that? What is that smell? And you know, the Bible says Moses walking through the camp, and he's like, what is that smell? Now, he didn't know what it was going to smell like. They'd never seen it before. I can only, I, it bred worms. It had to stink. You know, they said it stank. What did it smell like? I don't know. It had to be pretty nasty. Because they didn't say, and it didn't smell good. They said it stank. All right? There are times when I've been in the car, and the car's not as clean as it should be, and I would say, oh, the car doesn't smell good. We need to clean it out. But we, one time, we went out there and we brought our groceries in and we left a carton of milk out there. And it stayed out there for weeks and it got like pried up underneath the, under the chair. You done that? <laughs> and we started to say, what is that smell? And by the time we finally figured it out because it had burst open, it stank. It, let me tell you, stank. Okay? It was nasty. It, you can still, I can still smell it. I mean, I can smell it from here. I mean, <laughs> no, we cleaned it out real good. But here's the thing. They said, what is this? What was the smell? The smell was disobedience. This is what God wanted them to see. You know what stinks, children of Israel? Disobedience. 
You see, the children of Israel, when they kept it, it wasn't because of the age of it, because when they kept two omers on the sixth day so they would have enough for the Sabbath and they would not have to go out to the field and get some more, when they kept two omers, God kept it. The only thing that made this stink was disobedience. And I'm going to tell you something. Disobedience will stink up a life. You, can, you say, Pastor, my life is a miracle. You know, I've seen people that have been miraculously saved. We had a lady get saved this Wednesday night, Brother Tom's niece. What a blessing that was. Where's Tom? Oh, my God. Tom, you moved. <laughs> I couldn't find you. <laughs> there he is. Uh, his niece got saved. And he, you know what he told me this morning? He said her countenance changed. Amen. Praise God. Now, she's not perfect yet. She's on the right path. She got saved. Yeah. We're praying for her. How long were we praying for her? I remember she called me on the phone some, a long time ago, Brother Tom. We've been praying for her on Sunday morning. You've mentioned her a long time. We've been praying for that, young, that lady, and she got saved Wednesday night. Praise God. She lives down in North Carolina. We've got a good church down there we're going to encourage her to go to. But let me tell you something. God does things. And when we're obedient to him, that smells good to God. But when we're disobedient, you know who disobedience is? The children of disobedience is what he calls them in Matthew and Ephesians chapter 5. It talks about all the sins of the flesh. Fornication, it talks about adultery, it talks about hatred, it talks about lying, it talks about all these things. And you look at all those lists of sins, and he says, this is what the children of disobedience do. In verse number 6, in verse number 7, he says, don't be partakers with them. Here's the deception of the devil. The devil takes something putrid. It makes you think it smells nice. Right. By deception. You know, the devil is like the sin Febreze. You ever see that Febreze commercial? They go in there and they, they spray everything, and then the guy goes, what is, oh, it smells like sweet roses. It smells like, you know, and they're going on and on. I smell the flowers of the field. You know, and they're, and they're like all this, and then all of a sudden they take off the blinders, and they're like dead fish and, you know, garbage and... Let me tell you something, that Febreze is going to wear out. Right? I, I always think to myself, when, I'm, when I see him sitting in that room, I said, yeah, let him stay there another 10 minutes. Let's see, how, let's see how flower it smells. Let me tell you something, that is sin. Smells good, tastes good, looks good, breeds worms, stinks. Grows in your life, becomes awful becomes wicked. And then you know what happens? Other people see it. I don't, you know, Moses didn't see it at first. He didn't, he wasn't sitting there in the house and seeing it, but eventually their testimony was, not, was known and Moses was angry at him, but Moses is not God. God knew right away. Right. Later on, God punishes these same people because of their complaining even when they were getting quail. He was bringing them meat every evening. Bread in the morning, meat in the evening. They started eating the meat. They said, oh, man, we're sick of this meat. What else you got, God? Can you bring some cattle through here? God gave them the meat until it was coming out their nostrils, he said, and they made them all sick. And many of them died. Disobedience is what stank up the people of God. One of the most important obedience we have is obedience to the gospel. Amen. Some people have a problem with that. And that's a stink that will not go away. I want you to look over in Ephesians chapter 5. You know, the Bible tells us that people who don't know the Lord, it says they prof there are some people out there that profess to know the Lord. In other words, they call themselves Christians. And it says they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work 
reprobate. To every good work, they're rotten. They stink. They come in, they try to do good works, but eventually it comes back to themselves. It comes back to man's hand being in there. Look at what smells nice to God. First of all, chapter 5 and verse number 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Do you know what smells nice to God? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The love of Christ for you and I. And think about it. It was a horrible day. It was a dark day. It was a day when they beat Jesus mercilessly. It was a day when they mocked him in the most wicked tones that anybody could ever imagine. Who knows the words that he heard that day. It was a day they spit upon the Savior. And when he hung on the tree, they sat there and they said, You saved others, save yourself. And Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not just that they were, say, they were killing the Savior, not just that they were killing the righteous, but also that one day they would stand before him. And as horrible and as dark as that day was, it was a sweet-smelling Savior to God. Why? Not because of the act, but because of the outcome. Because Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Do you know what God says? Be sweet. Be sweet. Live like Christ. Receive him as your Savior, but you want to have a life that smells good to God? Live like the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think to yourself, well, can I do this or can I do that? Live like Christ. 2 Corinthians, going back just a few books here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse number 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. And them that are saved and in them that perish, to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ. You know what he's saying? We tell the truth. To some, that truth means people are lost. But you know, people can't get saved. They don't know they're lost. For others, they see the power and the love of God. They see what God can do. And they realize that God can take a stinking life and make it a sweet life in Christ. And the hope that we have, as I said this morning, the example is that of hope. The hope that we have in God. For every single person, I can look at somebody and say, but you don't know how bad this person is, but I can say, but God can fix anything. If it was in God's will, he could have turned that manna right back into sweet selling manna, if that's what he wanted to do, but he had an illustration to make. And he did such things. He brought water from a rock. Our God is able to save anybody. Our God is able to secure anybody, to bring them up and to use them and to make even the lowest people that we see in this world that we may think that person's life is horrible, God died for that person, he can make them a sweet smell unto him. That's what God does in us. Now, it's a miracle, but even a miracle can stink in disobedience. If you disobey God, your life can be putrefying and harmful to the cause of Christ. Can I show you just one more? Because this is a little bit off the beaten path, but I want to show you this. Book of Revelation, chapter 5. I've got to say this before I close this morning. 
Book of Revelation, chapter 5. And verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Do you know what smells sweet to God? Prayer. Prayer. Murmuring, no. Murmuring, no, no, no. Prayer, yes. Do you know what we need to do for America? Pray. I get so tired of everybody complaining how bad America is. I know America's a problem, but America's still greater than any other country I've ever been in, and I've been in a lot of them. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I thank God for the freedom I have now, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm standing on. But I know America is going down the tubes morally, and I know it's going down the tubes as far as believing in God the way people should and standing up for what's right. And I'm going to tell you, what we need to do for America, what we need to do for our leadership is pray. Amen. What we need to do for our church and what we need to do with the church's leadership is pray. What we need to do for ourselves and the needs and the burdens in our life is pray. And not only is it good because we're going to the one that can change this world, that can reign bread from heaven for 40 years, but also it pleases God and it has a sweet smell to him. I'm willing to pray for anything and I'm willing to pray as often as I can because I know no matter what I do in this world, that is going to smell sweet to Jesus. Be sweet. When we say, what is that smell? Let it be a good smell. Let's close this morning in a word of prayer.